Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is the one and only Michael Port. Uh, now, Michael and I got the chance to meet a while back at uh, Jason Gaynard's Mastermind Talk event, Talks event. So um, he was one of the speakers there. And just to give you a little bit of info on Michael, so uh, called the, an uncommonly honest author by the Boston Globe, a marketing guru by the Wall Street Journal, and a sales guru by Canada's Financial Post, Michael is a New York Times bestselling author of five books, which we'll talk about in this interview, including Book Yourself Solid, Beyond Book Solid, The Contrarian Effect, The Think Big Manifesto, and the all new book, Book Yourself Solid Illustrated. So we'll be talking about those books in this interview. And what I'm really excited to talk about is you know, speaking and coaching gigs and using the book for that. And also, this is right in Michael's wheelhouse, is Booking Yourself Solid. So Michael, welcome. Hey, great to be here. Awesome. Well, I want to start by taking it back to the beginning uh, for just a little bit, and then we'll move into kind of the nuts and bolts and going through these books. But take us back to your first book, and why did you decide to write that book? Well, that's what everybody did. They wrote a book because they wanted <laughs> yeah. to be well known in the industry. So I sort of scratched my head, and I said, well, maybe I could do that too. I mean, honestly, it was that, it was that naive, but I think that naivete was really powerful it allowed me not to get too hung up on should I, shouldn't I, it's going to be hard, it's going to be easy. I just said, well, it seems like a natural progression. You know, I've been doing this now for a couple of years. I want to get better known. I know it's a great marketing tool. I know it'll help me book more business. I know it'll help me increase my fees. You know, I all I see is benefits. All I see is positives. So now the question is, can I write well enough? Because I had some content that I'd already created. I was teaching in my courses. But again, I was only in the business for a couple of years at that point. And I knew I'd have to turn that content into a narrative to work inside a book format because just putting content into a book uh, often leaves the book lacking. There really needs to be a narrative that runs through the book. So I knew I'd have to figure that out. But I, I didn't really know if I was a good enough writer because I'd been doing a little copywriting to try to market my stuff. But... So what I did is I just started writing a little bit every day about anything. It didn't even have to be about the material that would go in the book, just about anything. And sometimes I'd have no idea what I'd write about. So I'd see a water bottle on the table and I'd write about the water bottle. What a lovely water bottle. It has a blue label and I see the beads of water dripping down, you know, and then I would just, just get into the habit of writing more. And that made a big difference for me. So I wrote the book proposal. I sold it to a book publisher. I got a deal really quickly, which is unusual. The, that title, Book Yourself Solid, you know, got a lot of people perked up. It was a really powerful title. Uh, six months later, I handed in the book. And about six months after that, when it was released, I hit number two on Amazon, not in a category, but in the world, right behind Dr. Oz. And then it was off to the races from there. Everything changed afterwards. And I mean that. Everything changed afterwards. And tell, talk, let's talk about what changed here in just a second. First off, tell us about that writing process. You, so you just started about writing about anything and everything, and then six months later, you said you turned the book in. What uh, happened in between there, and how did you yeah, get the book right. in? Well, actually, the, the, the little bit each night was before I sold the book, before I wrote the proposal. And so that was just for me to figure out, could I do it? Could I write enough uh, on, a, on a regular basis? Could I, did I like it enough? Uh, was I any good at it? And that, that was what got me into it. But then the process of writing the book, um, you know, I knew that the, the more organized you are with your information, the more of an expert you're perceived to be. Interestingly enough, you know, you could take somebody who's, you could take two people who are competent at a particular craft, and one of them is not super organized, but they're good at what they do. The other one is super organized and just as good as the first one, but the one who's super organized with respect to how they organize that information is perceived as the expert. So I knew that the organization of the book was important. And what I did with Book Yourself Solid is I took a lot of disparate ideas and I organized them into a repeatable system, which was easier to consume. So I took all of the ideas and I broke them down into modules. And I said, well, this group of it, this, this, bit of information needs to be in this module, this in this module, this and this and this. And then I started to look at, well, what's inside each module? And can I create a sequential process inside each module 
to move from the beginning of the module to the end of the module. And then if you did that for each module, by the end of the whole book, you'd have a complete a rep replicable system uh, that would allow you to get book solid. And then over time, uh, as I, you know, now I, my sixth book is coming out October 6th called Steal the Show. It, interesting, October 6th, sixth book. I didn't really make that connection until just now. And over time, what I've learned how to do is to organize the information really well. So I have a number of different structures that I use depending on the book. Uh, and I use these also for information products, for courses that I do, uh, for coaching uh, programs. I don't do individual coaching anymore, really. But my coaches uh, do individual coaching, and they use these same kind of structures uh, to do their coaching. But one of them is the modular framework. It's such a, a, such a wonderful way to organize big chunks of information, which if you put it, you know, put them all together, it might feel a little bit much, a little bit overwhelming. And then the, the chronological format, of course, is, you know, step one, two, three, four. People love that, easy to consume. There's the numerical framework, which is, say, Stephen uh, Covey's habit, uh, seven ha habits for highly effective people. You don't necessarily need to go in any particular order. You could teach one or two or three or all seven of those particular habits. But it's such an easy way to organize the information and then for the audience or the reader to consume the information. There's a compare and contrast type framework, which is what Jim Collins uses in Good to Great. He took X number of good companies, X number of great companies, and he showed you what was similar and what was different. And then your job is to take what was different and apply it to your company and then be one of those great companies. There's a problem solution format. So simply identify X number of problems and offer a solution for each one. You can do that in numerical framework. And then you've got a combined framework, uh, two co frameworks combined, just like I did with uh, modular and sequential. And, you know, then there's the reference framework, which is literally just a reference book, like uh, Words That Sell by Richard Bain. It's literally lists of words that are supposed to sell in copywriting. I don't know if they do, but you've got emotional words, sexy words, intense words, and they're just lists. And it's in, I don't know what edition, maybe the sixth edition or something. I didn't know there are new words invented, you know, from the first edition. But apparently, uh, he's got more and more uh, editions that keep coming out. And it's a very popular book. So there are a number of different books that you can find and that you've probably read that fall into those different frameworks. And it's just a way in. It's a great way to get into the organization of the information. Got it. I love those different frameworks. Now, of your five books and you've got a six coming out, which frameworks have you followed for each of those books? You want to walk us through that real quick? Because I'd love to dive in a little bit on these frameworks. Sure. So Book Yourself Solid was modular with a sequential framework inside those modules. Beyond Book Solid was modular, period. Didn't have a sequential framework inside. There were a number of chapters inside each module, but it didn't really matter in which order you went inside each module. So that was just modular. Uh, the contrarian effect uh, followed the three-act structure, as did the Think Big Manifesto. The three-act structure is one I didn't mention now because it's a. I didn't want to detail it too much because sometimes for the newer writer, uh, when you're writing self or business help books, it's it's a little harder to wrap your mind around. The three-act structure is Aristotle's three-act structure, and it's the structure we use anytime we are telling a story. Anytime you see a play, a movie, a film, you'll see something close to the three-act structure. And, and it works like this. In Act 1, there's exposition. It's the given circumstances. It's the time, the setting, the place. Everything you need to know in order to understand the conflict that follows in Act 2. Act 2 is the meat of the story. It's what is drawn out throughout the storytelling. And the more conflict, the more intense the story. And then Act 3 is the resolution. Now, you can write your books in that uh, structure. You can give your speeches using that structure. But, but sometimes the other structures, the other frameworks, rather, are a little bit easier to enter into, I think, for the newer uh, self or business help writer. But any of the stories that you tell inside any of the other frameworks, because you're going to tell stories when you're writing a book or giving a speech, the three-act structure is a must. That's a guideline for telling stories and for telling jokes. Uh, jokes also often follow the three-act structure. And Steal a Show is about, not telling jokes, but there is a chapter on humor and telling jokes, but it's about not only public speaking, but how to steal the show in all the performances of your life because 
think about it. As Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. And we play lots of different roles in many different situations. We need to know how to play the right role in the right situation at the right time and kill it when we do. So Steal the Show is really about, uh, you know, how to get a standing ovation for all the performances in your life, whether it's speeches, job interviews, uh, deal closing pitches, or even a first date. And understanding the three-act structure can help you in, tho in those areas, and it can also help you when you're actually writing a book. Now, these structures that you're talking about, do you use these structures just for writing books, or do you also use these similar structures for writing speeches? Absolutely, for writing speeches. When in heroic public speaking, which is the division of my uh, company that teaches public speaking, th this is a major part of our work on content development with our speakers. If you just take a whole bunch of information and throw it together and then go up there and try to explain it to an audience, that's not a performance. That's just a talk. And at heroic public speaking, what we're trying to do is help people stop speaking and start performing. So when you're in front of a room, when you're on a stage, you're actually putting on a show. That doesn't mean you're doing rah, 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 like song and dance. It's not that kind of thing, but it's an experience for the audience. If, if, um, if people go and look, go to YouTube and look for Think Big Revolution, search for Think Big Revolution, that there's an excerpt, a 16 minute excerpt of a keynote that I give. And you'll see how it feels more like you're watching a show. I even bring in dancers any city that I go to, I'll hire dancers to come in to do a dance routine at the end of the keynote, you know, for the big closing number. And they learn the choreography before we go. So it feels very different. And what I'm trying to do is help these speakers. And, and, and if, you're, if you're a writer, you're going to need to speak. Very few writers uh, don't go on the speaking circuit at some point. And if you can't be, if you're not best in class when you're on the speaking circuit, you, it's harder to sell books. You'll sell more books if you're best in class. That's all there is to it. And I remember seeing uh, you speak at Mastermind Talks in Toronto, and it, it did feel like a show, right? There was the audio that came over. I remember there was like a conversation with yourself that started off the speech, and, and it was a total pattern interrupt, and you're hearing that, and you're like, wait, whoa. And then you start hearing the speech going, and then you come in, and it's instant attention yeah. grabber from the very start. And I, well, I just, it's funny, like all this time later, I remember that, and that sticks out because like you said, it was a performance. It wasn't right. just a speech. Well, in that particular case where I did ask her to come out, talk to the audience a little bit, and all of a sudden my phone rings, except it's ringing on the speakers. So people are like, what, what's going on? And I say, I'm so sorry, this, this doesn't happen to me usually. Just give me a second, let me answer the phone. So I take the phone out and I have a conversation with somebody on the phone that everybody listens to. And instead of telling, and it's about making commitments and fulfilling them. And what, what happens in the phone conversation is I get berated for not fulfilling a commitment. And so what I'm doing is instead of telling the audience, listen, you need to do the things you say you're going to do, which is how most speakers will come out and do it. I, I showed them what happens to you when you don't fulfill commitments, but I put myself in the place of the person not making the commitment. And then it was fun to watch. It was watching an experience rather than being told what to do or even told a story about a time I didn't fulfill a commitment. It's still more interesting to watch it happen in the moment. Got it. And so before we move on, let's recap those different story structures real quick. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you have the numerical framework, the number of keys, rules. Then you have a sequential framework or chronological, which is a number of steps. And then you have a modular framework, which organizes lots of information into chunks to make it easier to consume. And of course, you can combine frameworks. Often a modular is used with either a numerical or a sequential inside it. There's a problem solution framework, which again can be used with a numerical framework. There's a compare and contrast framework, which is uh, not used as much, but is very effective. Uh, and then there is a three act structure type of framework. And there's also a reference framework. Awesome. And I love the examples as well um, that you that yeah. you went on earlier because those are like, as you were saying them i could uh, just because i read most of the you know the good to great the i uh, forget the other ones the, the seven habits of highly effective people like those different ones it's yeah. great to be able to have examples that you can tie them to and then steal the show is a modular framework and inside each module i've taken careful consideration with respect to which 
cop concept or topic to introduce, uh, f you know, first, second, third, you know, the order that I introduce them to, but it's not sequential in a step one, two, three, four necessarily. So module one is all about the performer's mindset, the way you need to see the world in order to be somebody who can steal the show. And then part two is all the performer's principles. You need to understand these principles before you go off and try to be a performer. So you understand the way you see the world and the things that a performer does from a principal perspective that helps them become a performer. And then part three is a tour de force on public speaking skills, tactics, strategies. So all the content creation, all the rehearsal process, all the performance work, all the improv, all the openings, the closings, and so much more. And I, it's important that, you know, you don't read part three really, I mean, uh, part three, which is in this modular framework before part one, because you're getting the technique. It's sort of like, it's like um, learning all this marketing stuff, but having no foundation for the business, right? You know, you don't have a target market. Well, you learn Facebook ads, but what are you going to do with them if you don't have a target market? That kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. You're, you know how to run Facebook ads and you know the technical pieces of everything, right. but you're running ads to 50 plus year old men when you should be running ads to 20 to 30 year old women. Exactly. Or you're running them to 42 different target markets uh, and they're all going to the same completely bland, uh, sterile page and none of them see it as a page that they uh, should be at. So again, it's the cart before the horse sometimes. Got it. Now, you mentioned this a second ago. I want to go back to this. As you said, everything changed with that first book. Tell yeah. us what you mean by that. Well, more money, more clients. Uh, I have a lot more pride. You know, I felt so much better about myself because I was, I was accomplishing the things that I wanted to accomplish, the things that I said I was going to accomplish, the things I set out to accomplish. So speaking fees went up considerably. Coaching fees went up considerably. Numbers of enroll uh, uh, people enrolling in my programs went up considerably. Number of doors opening up to me went up considerably. Number of people who are colleagues, influential colleagues that were calling me up to meet me went up considerably. And these are all the things that you need if you want to continue to grow a business, you know, in this space. And when we're talking about speaking and coaching fees, is that like 25% increase? Is it double? Like what's, what's the difference? Right, so let's take the speaking, for example. Before I wrote Book Yourself Solid, I give a lot of free speeches and like I'd be really lucky to get maybe 1500 bucks. Like, yes, 1500 bucks. Awesome. When the book came out, uh, you know, right after it went up to number 2 on Amazon in the world and you know did really well, then I charged 5000. I just changed that 5000, that's what it is, and I was getting it. I'm like, "Wait a minute, I'm getting five. 5 months later, 10,000. A year and a half later, I was up to 20 and 25 and now 30. So that was 10 years ago. So it took me, you know, 2006 is when it came out. So nine years ago. So it took me from 2006 to 2015 to go, you know, go from about free or $1,500 if I was lucky to $30,000 a speech. And for me to go uh, higher than 30, Steal the Show has to become as big a book as a good to great or a seven habits of highly effective people. That, the next book's got to do that. If, it, if it's not as big as one of those books, but still uh, as big as say book yourself solid, you know, maybe I'll go up another five, maybe in five, 10 years, another, another five after that. But there, you know, there, that's sort of the ceiling until you become ridiculously famous. Got you know, like it. A, a Tim Ferriss kind of famous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, do you see incremental, like, have you seen incremental boosts with each of those five books? Like, with each book, your speaking fee goes up. Are those related at all? Like, what does that look um, like? Well, you know, here's the mistake that I made. If I was going to go back and do it again, this is what I do differently. I always put a dramatic pause right after that because people always want to know what the mistakes were. <laughs> yeah, right? So, pause for emphasis. Pause. Lean in. Close up. No, the biggest mistakes that the biggest mistakes that I made was writing too many books too fast. See, I don't know if I thought that people are going to take me more seriously or think I was smarter if I wrote a whole bunch of books, but I really should have stopped for a while after that first book did really well because I put out another four books after that. Well, actually, 2006, Book Yourself Solid, 2008, Beyond Book Solid, 2009, no, 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 2000 and, 
Yeah, 2008 were two books, Beyond Book Solid and then The Contrarian Effect, right on the heels of each other. 2009 was the Think Big Manifesto. But in 2010, I did a second edition of Book Yourself Solid. And then in 2012, I did a Book Yourself Solid Illustrated. Right, So that was a whole redo of the book uh, using visuals, cutting a lot of the text and having an illustrator uh, illustrate the concept so you could look at it and get it rather than just having to read it. And that did very, very well. But do you see, that's a lot of books in a short period of time. So what would have made a lot more sense was to do Book Yourself Solid, wait, do a second edition three years later, wait, then three years later, do that Book Yourself Solid Illustrated as a whole new kind of book and just focus the back end of the business on Book Yourself Solid because that's what I ultimately did. You can only sell a certain number of number of things at the same time. I, mean, I, I can't sell 40 different programs on 40 different topics at the same time. It's too much. It's not going to work. So the business for the last 10 years has been focused on Book Yourself Solid. There's a Book Yourself Solid mentoring program. There's a Book Yourself Solid coach certification program. So you see how uh, this is. these are some of the ways that you repurpose all the intellectual property in the book to actually exploit it, to leverage it financially, to monetize it. Uh, and then we do shorter courses and keynotes and um, uh, uh, and we have individual coaches who will work with our clients as well. Then the new business over the last two years is the HeroicPublicSpeaking.com business and that's what Steal the Show is designed to promote and that'll be the next 10 years, 15 years of intellectual property. So there are two businesses focusing on Book Yourself Solid and Public Speaking. But all those other books in the middle, I, I don't have the time to promote and run offers on those books. I don't have the time to market all of those. They're called your backlist. It's too much. So if you write a book that nobody reads, well, then try another one and maybe people will read that one. But if you write something that works really well, just stay with that for a while. It's different than say, because say Book Yourself Sound is different than the Seth Godin type book. It's a per an important distinction I think um, is probably new to mo many folks. There's a difference between the message book and the curriculum book, just like there's a difference between a message speech and a curriculum speech. So message book is like a Think Big Manifesto book that I wrote or the contrarian effect kind of book. It often comes in that three-act structure. Tim, um, Seth Godin's books are message books. You know, Tim, if you read, say, Tribes by Seth Godin, you'll get the concept of what a tribe is, but you won't necessarily know exactly how to create your own. And that's not knocking Tim Seth's books. Seth's books are fantastic. He's not designing the book to be a curriculum book. It's an one idea, this idea of tribes. I want you to get it. I, he said, you know, he says, I want you to get this conceptually. I want you to see it in the examples that I give. I want you to understand what makes a tribe philosophically, conceptually, theoretically. And now you've got to go out and do it. And most of his books are like that. And they're incredible. You read them fast. You really get it, get inspired by it, connect with other people who are inspired by them. And he puts out lots of them to keep current with what's current, uh, you know, in the world as he sees it, you know, in relation to marketing. But Book Yourself Solid is a curriculum book. John Jantz, um, John Jantz's book, uh, Duct Tape Marketing, John's a good friend of mine, is a curriculum type book. So these books, they can be evergreen books for many, 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 many years to come. And if you write that kind of book that does well, you want to really promote that. You're driving people into the offerings that uh, that are based on uh, the curriculum in that book, and you build your business around that. Whereas Seth doesn't offer programs based on any of his books. He's not offering a how-to program on developing a tribe, or a how-to program on getting through the dip, or a how-to program on et cetera, et cetera. So there are different kinds, and when you go into book writing or speech making, you want to make sure that you are clear on which type you are creating got it and and so as part of that it sounds like you said those books in the middle the mistake mostly was that you didn't have a back end for those is that right and that there it was too spread thin and you didn't just have one channel to send people to yeah i say it was a mistake writing them because it, i didn't i wasn't i wasn't selling anything on the back end of those necessarily i mean i would give speeches on the contrarian effect but it wasn't that different to what I was doing with Book Yourself Solid. Part of the reason I wrote that at the time is because I figured it would be better for speeches for sales organizations because they saw Book Yourself Solid uh, as a book for entrepreneurs, for people who are in the service industry who want to build their own business. And they said it was really good, but it's not really a sales book for our group. And sales 
um, conferences, tell, you know, events around sales are, are plentiful and they pay well. So I thought, let me write the contrarian effect so they really see, ah, this is a sales process. It wasn't the same material, but of course, a lot of the philosophy from with respect to marketing is the same because it's from me. It's not going to be so different. It's it's still me. Uh, and then I did keynotes based on that for a while, but then again, I, I pulled it back down. I said, just keynotes um, on on um, Book Yourself Solid. I did the keynote on the Think Big Revolution, which is based on the Think Big Manifesto. And now um, uh, Steal the Show will be uh, the next uh, focus, you know, as that book comes out for keynotes. But you don't do a, a whole bunch of different keynotes for people to pick off a list, changing them every time. It doesn't work. You want your signature intellectual property. You want to get known for that, build a thriving business around it, and then, you know, keep producing content that's going to put more people into that business. Whereas, say, book beyond book solid is perfect if you're, you're starting to get booked up and you're busy, too much time, you're not sure how to handle all of it, getting overwhelmed. You read beyond book solid, figure out how to leverage scale uh, and create a more profitable business that's a lot easier to run. But I can't run a whole separate mentoring program on Beyond Book Solid with all the different things we do. It dilutes our efforts. So right now, we've tried it in the past. We've done a little bit of it. Right now, one of our lead coaches really wants to do something with it. So he's proposing to us that we bring it back. And I keep going. I don't know. I just, the pipeline, you know, it's it's full. It's, it's just, it's a lot of stuff. So I think that kind of simplicity, clarity, it's not something I had when I was younger. I get a little clearer as you go through the muddy waters. So it sounds like for those, because uh, there's a couple things that are kind of tying together on my end. Um, and I just want to confirm that this is what you're saying. So earlier you said, okay, there's a ceiling for your speaking fee unless, unless you just boom and become Tim Ferriss or whatever, you know, and, and it's a much bigger, or you have a, a, a massive book that becomes like a, a timeless classic. So you were talking about that. And then you were also talking about how, well, these middle books, I could speak on them, but there was nothing else. So like those two things make me think that what you're saying is like the back end of your book is much more than just speaking on it. Like what would that percentage breakdown be? Oh my God. Are you kidding? It's here. Put it this way. This is like, I don't I put it this way. When I do my financial projections, I do not put speaking in them at all <laughs> because I don't want to have to rely on it. If I don't want to go speak, I don't have to go speak. But even if I'm getting $30,000 and sometimes you take less because you negotiate, it's like an hour drive from your house. You're like, you know what? I'll come for 20. It's fine. So that's, that's my regular fee for flying across the country to speak at a big conference. But, but you know, if I do that once a month, that's, that's not going to keep the lights on for me. So when we, our programs, our book yourself solid mentoring program is $12,000. Our book yourself solid coach certification program is 15 going up to 20. Those are much more profitable programs because of course they're leveraged, they're scalable. Uh, and you know, it, it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, that's that. And the same thing, our heroic public speaking, um, you know, we do every February, do a huge event in Florida. Heroic Public Speaking Live. We have our Heroic Public Speaking Total Immersion Program, which is an online uh, live uh, learning experience, you know, distance learning. That's, you know, that's where the money, if we're putting a few hundred people in every program at a time, if we put 600 people in the live event, that's, you know, that's the, that's the kind of model that is much more profitable. It takes more work than just getting on a plane and going and standing on a stage. It takes more work from a business perspective, but if you are able to create processes and systems, manage other people, then you can build something real that has value over time because most of the speakers at my um, uh, sort of status level in terms of how well known we are as authors or how many books we've sold as authors, most of us are probably in the 15 range, maybe 20 range, probably 15, sometimes 10 even. But I'm at the, the 30 range because of my ability to perform. So I can do more than just come and present the information. So that's one of the things that stands makes me stand apart. But I, I mention it because most people who are in my area are around that 15 or maybe even 20 range. But think about how many speeches you have to do to make a lot of money. Now you're saying, not you, but somebody at home might be saying, well, geez, you know, if I do three a week, that's 60 a week, six times four, it's 240 a month. Well, that's a, you know, a couple million bucks, right? Yes, but 
you're, you may not be booking that many speeches every week. If you are, you're on the road all the time. You know, $2 million is nice, but, you know, a lot of it goes to taxes pretty quickly. And, and it's all you. If you want to take two, three, four, five months off on your boat, for example, <laughs> then you're out of luck because you've got to be on the road. There's no other revenue. There's no licensing of the intellectual property that you're making money off. And, um, you know, you can't really have other people go give the speech for you unless you are licensing people. Uh, I do that. I have coaches who speak on Book Yourself Solid. So if someone comes in and says, listen, we want you to come, but we have a budget of five grand or 10 grand. I say, oh, you should bring Anna Malikian. She's the director of training for the, you know, for the school of coach training or, um, or Francine Graglia, who's the head coach. You know, these are the people who should come because that's the right budget. They go, they kill it, and it works out great for everybody. So you see what I mean? It's either a real yeah. business or a practice. And I think that it's a perfectly fine choice to make it practice. I mean, my father's a psychiatrist. He has a practice. Uh, he has to sit in a chair every day and talk to people or listen to them. And that's his business. That's his practice rather, but it's not a business. For me, a business is something that has scale leverage. Um, and is something that if I need to go away for a while can exist without me. Exactly. At that, at that point, it's, you're technically an entrepreneur, but it's still a job. Yeah, you're not, I mean, not really an entrepreneur, I don't think. I mean, I think you're a, a solo professional. Yeah, that's a good point. I think you're an entrepreneur when you start creating things that can live without you running them. That's just my definition. I don't want to argue with anybody about it. It's just, it's just a, however you see it, it's fine. People are solo professionals. They see themselves as entrepreneurs. That's great. Uh, but, but my personal definition, it helps because I want to focus on creating things that are scalable that have leverage that helps me if i think of an entrepreneur that way it helps me stay true to being an entrepreneur rather than you know focusing on creating things that i have to go do all the time now you, we were talking about that back end and how that's you know the holy grail of your revenue you don't even count speaking um on on your projections and stuff so are the books a big driver in that like what's the biggest driver books. For the sales in that, the books. So the books are the books, cool. and then yeah, the books, the books, the books, the books, the books. Definitely, giving speeches is a driver. There's no doubt about it. And if you want to give a lot of speeches, it'll be a huge driver. It's one of the most connected um, drivers you can use to move people into those kind of programs. I'm not a pitch from the stage guy, so that's not my thing. But if you're best in class, you're gonna the people in the audience are gonna come work with you. It's always been a simple proposition uh, to me. So. If you are willing to go out on the road and do that, it's a great driver. But you don't have to. I mean, you know, you don't have to go out on the road. I mean, also, you can do this from home, too. I mean, I'm talking to you right now, and I'm not home. I'm on the boat. But these days, more and more corporations are doing webinars or streaming video, and you don't always have to go out. So put it this way. To me, I think of the book as the driver, and then the other promotional strategies around that – are choices. So the book is a must. Facebook ads is a choice. Speaking is a choice. Blogging or writing articles is a choice. Uh, these are all different tools that you can use to help promote the book, which then helps put people into your products and services, into your programs. So you say the book is a must. So the person that might be asking, kind of like the, I feel like people always ask the chicken, the chicken or the egg thing, right? Like, do I need to speak before I have a book or do I need to have a book before I can be able to speak? What, what would your answer be to that? Um, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I, I'm, I'm not a, uh, and there's only one way thing. Like when I say the book is a must, I mean, the book is a must for me. Um, my good friend, Brian Clark from copy blogger has never written a book and it's become a joke now because he created copy blogger and he's asked to write books all the time and he keeps saying no. And he's just going to keep saying no because now it's his thing. Uh, Jordan Harbinger, you know, huge podcaster, Art of Charm, a uh, good friend of mine. He just came through our uh, Heroic Public Speaking graduate program. Great guy, great speaker, great performer. Uh, he hasn't written a book. He's got a huge platform. So podcasting is his platform, but he will do a book eventually. He's pretty sure of that. Uh, but it's your platform. For me, the book is the big platform. For someone else, it may be podcasting. For someone else, it you know, maybe uh, their blog. So whatever your platform is, is a must. Uh, if you can build that platform in such a significant way that you don't need the others, like I don't, 
have a podcast. People say, why don't I have a podcast? Because it'd be perfect for you. You're a performer, blah, blah, blah. Because it's another thing that you have to do often. You got to make your choices. You got to pick. You've got to pick. So, so there's, I'm going to do a, a something with podcasting. I'm not telling what yet around the book launch. I'm not going to reveal what it is yet. going to be a surprise, but I don't do a regular podcast uh, that takes an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of, uh, of research, an enormous amount of commitment, uh, you know, just because I don't want to add that in right now because I have other things that I do to promote and I have another kind of platform. So it's a choice. That's what's important. Got it. And what made you choose books as your platform? Well, let's see. When I started writing, I wrote the book in 2005, so there was no podcasting. There was blogging, but, you know, I don't know. It wasn't quite as big. No social media platforms. So that was it. I mean, pretty much. There was, you know, was there a YouTube? Maybe there was YouTube. I don't think there was even a YouTube. If there was, you could upload only a few minutes of video. You couldn't upload a whole hour of video if you wanted to. So that's what that's what it was then. And I got known as an author. I got, you know, New York Times bestselling status. And once I was in that category, you know, I stayed with that category and I enjoy it. I, I, I feel like I do a good job at it. And that's important too. And and why have you stayed in it? Because I'm pretty good at it now. So I have a routine. I have good relationships with the different publishers. I get good deals in my books. Um, I know how to write the books. I've got some experience. I know how to market them, although I hate the launch. I hate it, hate it, hate it, because it's so much work. I mean, it's just a massive amount of work, but it's part of the process. It's the job part. It's what you got to do. You got to, you know, grin and bear it and just get it done. But with that said, it's the long game that counts. Because you anybody can spike books in a week. And that's what most people do to hit the lists. I say, don't worry about the lists. Focus on number of sales over time. Obviously, we're going to go for big numbers at the beginning. We want to hit the list. All that is important, but it's not the primary focus. The primary focus is making this a best-selling evergreen book so that anytime anybody thinks about public speaking or performance, they think about steal the show. That's what I want. So long game, that's what's important. Because if you promote really hard for a couple of weeks and then you stop, unless that book just you're so lucky or it's just so good that you know you know people are just screaming about how good it is it's it's going to have a hard time continuing on unless you get hit by the tim ferris lucky stick or the oprah lucky stick and you get the oprah effect or the tim ferris effect it's going to die a slow death so you got to keep keep promoting over long periods of time until it becomes evergreen and then a lot, the aggregate of the promotion you've done continues to sell books. Doesn't mean you stop, but I don't have to do as much promotion around Book Yourself Solid now as I did in the first couple of years. I need to do more promotion now around Steal the Show, which is going to be the new book because that's got to um, become the go-to book uh, for people on performance and public speaking so they start recommending it to each other the way they do with Book Yourself Solid. So it's making long-term decisions and not making short-term decisions just to hit the list that sacrifice the long term. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what decisions you would make now that would sacrifice the long term to hit the list, but I think what might happen is that you put all your all your efforts into the short term and you don't continue to promote it over the long term, and that's where you suffer. That's where uh, it gets hit. But look, at the end of the day, people have to like the book. So you could promote till you're blue in the face. You could do really well at the beginning because nobody's read the book yet. <laughs> and and then once they've read it, they don't love it, and it doesn't do as well. And that happens uh, sometimes too. Cool. So let's take a step back for just a second. I'm going to dive back in, in into what we were talking about just a little bit, which is that back end. So we've got all these things on the back end. Can you take us through how people go from the book to buying one of those programs? Like you talked about it, there, there are several programs and, and they're different focuses. So can you take us through that transition? Like I pick up a book. How do I get into one of these programs from that book? I'll give you a few examples. So in Book Yourself Solid, right at the beginning, it says, do you want a free workbook? You can have one. I have a 92-page workbook that details all of the uh, questions uh, and exercises in the book. So if you want to work on uh, you know, this material outside of the book, just go over here, opt in, you'll get it for free, uh, and you'll be able to use it. And What's interesting is that what's in that workbook is exactly what's in the book. It's just the questions and exercises. So it's not something else. 
and yet people still want it. So they go get it, they download it, and then uh, over time we will ask them different questions about, so uh, are you interested in potentially becoming a Book Yourself Solid Certified Coach? And if they say yes, then we talk to them about that. If they say no, we don't. If then you know, we'll ask them, are you interested in learning more about the Book Yourself Solid Mentoring Program or so we can help you get Book Solid or would you like some private coaching? Or, and then we'll talk to them about whichever ones uh, they respond to. And then what we've done is we've de designed some, some pretty comprehensive follow-up sequences that are pretty intelligent. Uh, and there's a lot of, we've designed a lot of if this, then that scenarios so that people are getting the right information at the right time. It's not always, it's, it's an art more than a science, unfortunately. If it was just a perfect science, we'd be even better at it. We'd, you know, be 100% successful in, you know, securing all business in the world, but we're not. Uh, there is a science to it, and we keep working on learning it. We're not uh, masters at it yet, but we're, we're getting better at it every single year. But there's also an art to it, um, and you have to feel that out, and, you know, based on the particular people you serve and how you talk to them, uh, what, how much communication they want, how much they don't want, you know, those kind of things. And we err on the side of more communication than less. We just find that we will get some more people opting out because with more communication than less, but we also have more sales. So we're focused on results rather than approval. And if more people are saying yes to the sales, then we're doing something right when sending more communication. And if they don't want to stay, then they just opt out and you know it's no problem uh, for them. Then on the uh, heroic public speaking side of the business, what we do is in throughout the book in Steal the Show, uh, I'll offer opportunities to go get videos based on some of the different concepts that I'm talking about in the book so they can see me either um, demonstrating it or verbalizing it in video. And then they go over to some of them are at heroicpublicspeaking.com, some at stealtheshow.com. And they go over there and they can opt in for those videos. And then the, you know, a similar process starts. So we invite them to the Heroic Public Speaking Live in February invite them to the immersion programs. And, you know, a lot of times people will design all of their offers uh, in a funnel concept. You know, this idea that you will, you give the tiny little offer first, then a little bigger, then a little bigger, then the really big ones. We don't really do it that way because we have found over the years that not everybody buys in the same pattern, not everybody buys at the same speed. So we'll have people who will join um, our largest program, a $25,000 program, after five years of subscribing and just reading some emails every once in a while, but not buying anything else. So they didn't buy a low level and then a medium level. And then, and then we'll find people who will buy that same size offering two weeks after they opted in. They're fast decision makers. They need it right now. So they're going to take advantage or maybe their sister sent them over and their sister said, listen, Michael Port is 100% trustworthy. You've got to work with him. He's the best in the business. Go now. And they go and they do it because this, they're coming from a trusted source, which then, you know, uh, makes them trust us faster. They don't have to spend as much time getting to know us. So we just, I just generally recommend that people be careful not to always assume that everybody moves through a sales cycle in the same way. So they don't think of it as a funnel. Think about it more um, as a merry-go-round. You can get on or off wherever you want. Um, and you can switch horses, and it's not scary. It's pretty, pretty, pretty easy going. Uh, and people have the opportunity to stay on as long as they want or get up when they want. Awesome. Love that. Love that metaphor there. That really brings it home, I think, because I was just about to follow up with, okay, how do you have someone buying within two weeks? And then how do you have someone buying five years later? But that, I guess that only happens by having that myriad go around where every so often it's, hey, are you interested? Exactly. And then, I like the other big takeaway, which was, um, you, you said, what was the word you said? It was a, results versus approval. Yeah. So well, this I, is the I thing. love that. This is key. I'm telling you, man, this is key. Anytime I focus on approval, I screw it up. Anytime I focus on approval, I screw it up. When I focus on results, I do a good job. That's, that's generally what happens. When I was younger, I would say, even younger than you, I even maybe your age too. But you're probably older than you look. You're just young and handsome, right? <laughs> um, when I was younger, I think I focused more on approval than results. And I was fortunate because I worked hard trying to get approval, I'd also get some results. 
but I think I could have got a lot more results a lot faster if I focused primarily on results, not approval. Now, I'm much more comfortable focusing on results rather than approval. So, uh, you know, if if someone writes a bad review, okay, fine. If it's selling really well, I'm not going to let that bother me. Whereas my first wrote my first book, if I got one bad review, I'd be mortified. You know, I'd be like, oh my god, oh me, I'm terrible. Oh my god. <laughs> you know, my fourth grade teacher told me I was stupid was right. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> But, but now I'm just focused on the results. So I just don't get hung up by that stuff. And I encourage uh, folks to really focus on the results and not the approval. 100% agree. And that's something that I've, I've struggled with and I feel like I'm coming out of, right? Like, cause you get that bad review or you get that one pissed off person emailing you like, Hey, you're emailing me way too much or something. Yeah. And you let that cloud your judgment and affect your decisions when it shouldn't. Yes. It's hard. You know, when you're a sensitive person and you care about others, you care about doing a great job. Like I want everybody, I want everybody that reads my book, comes to a program, walk away going, Oh my God, I, I should have paid double for that. That's what I want. I want people to be completely blown away. Like I got more value than I expected more than I, you know, was promised. And I'm, I, I'm in love. Like that's what I want everyone to walk away with. And if they don't, my natural inclination is to feel bad. So I always first look at, did we not deliver something that we said we were going to? If the answer is no, we in fact delivered more, and I feel confident in that, then I let it go. Because you always have to ask yourself first, is this me or is it them? And uh, if it's, you know, if it's me, then I got to do something about that. But if it's not, don't let it hang you up. You know, don't let it, you know, get in your way. And then you can say, it's, it's, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, as we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit on the new book. Um, and what is the main goal behind that? It sounds like you've touched on that and that, that may be um, the, the new side of your business. Um, but I want to touch on that. And then also we'll circle back and see like, what are you doing differently on this new book? Sure. Well, Steal the Show is designed to serve the new business. I think even if I didn't have a whole business around public speaking, I might have written it anyway. That's how this, I was, I was driven by a demon to write this book. And you really shouldn't write books unless you're driven by some demon that you cannot control because, because it's a long, arduous, you know, trek through the mud and confusion and disappointment. But man, when you see that thing done, hey, will you bring me a galley, Amy? Yeah. They're in the bag in the other stateroom. So I guess you got the galleys two days ago and the galley is a book that the publisher makes. It sends out to all the media, um, uh, before it's final. Now this is what it looks like. Yeah. Soft cover. Cause galleys are soft. The book is going to be hardcover when it comes out. But when you have a, you know, a publisher like mine, they make these kinds of galleys and it's just when you hold it in your hand and you look through and go, I put down a paper what I wanted to put down a paper. And then you read it and go, Oh, this is good. Oh, I wrote that. That's good. You know, then a couple of times you're like, Oh shit. Oh, well, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. so, but for the most part. And so it's just such a wonderful feeling. So I would have, I look, I, I have a master's in acting from the graduate acting program at NYU. And I believe a lot of my success is, is as a result of my training as an actor, not just, a, not just with respect to speaking, but branding, marketing, performance plays a part in so many aspects of our life, even a first date is a performance. It really is. Hopefully it's an authentic one because if it's not, you're probably not going to get a second one. Yeah. But Chris Rock has a great joke. He says, you don't show up for your first date. Your representative shows up for your first date. When you go for a job interview, that's a performance. A negotiation is a performance. When you're trying to close a sale, that's a performance. Authenticity is the key. The best actors in the world are the most authentic actors in the world. They also happen often to be the most authentic people in the world. Not all of them, of course, there's always exceptions to every rule, but the ones that I've worked with, the ones that I've met. And so what I know about acting, I've used as a model in business and personal development to increase my confidence, to increase the, to improve the way that I move physically, because the way that you move physically tells a story. Everything you do, the way you move, 
It all tells a story about who you are. And that's a character that you are developing over time. You know, you think of yourself as an individual and this individual is a character to other people. And how does that character show up in the story that other people are telling about you? And how does that character play out in the story that you are writing in your own life? So Steal the Show, you know, it helps you overcome your fear, crush, you know, your critics or silence your critics, find your voice, play the right role in every situation, learn how to say yes and in difficult situations, be able to say as if I feel confident right now and then go in there and nail it, be able to stay in the moment so that you can actually hear what's coming at you and be very present, which we know makes a huge difference in interpersonal relationships. And then again, all of the work around public speaking. I mean, there's so many things that public speakers do right now that they do because others do it and they don't realize that it may actually be hurting their performance. For example, someone will often start a speech and go, so I'm really happy to be here. And the five guys that went before said the same thing. I'm really happy to be here. Well, of course you're happy to be there. What's the alternative? That you're really pissed off that you're there? So what you do is you show them that you're happy to be there. You don't say, now look, if I was asked to give the commencement speech at Tulane where I went for undergrad, I might say I'm happy to be here and quite surprised considering that I almost failed out my first semester while I was rushing a fraternity. So, you know, being back here is pretty cool at, you know, at this stage of the game. So there might be some reasons you say it. Again, the performer's job is in part to break the rules. So I break a lot of rules, but you got to know what the rules are before you break them. Uh, for example, I would not say before you tell a story, I'm going to tell you a story. Because the best stories are the ones that the audience doesn't even realize they're in until they're in the conflict of it. And you wouldn't want to ask them, uh, can I tell you a story? Because you never know. One guy might go, no, I'd rather you didn't. Could you just tell me, you know, and then you're completely screwed. You, you want to avoid saying, okay, let's get started. Because usually that's after a whole bunch of minutes of filler at the beginning. Like, oh my God, my, I just, you know, I just flew in and my arms are so tired. You know, whatever bad jokes people tell <laughs> at the beginning of the presentation. So because your speech started when your bio was read. Not when you walked on the stage. That's when the speech started, when your bio was read. Right? So there are so many things that, uh, we, that people do as speakers that they don't even know are negatively influencing the way the audience sees them because it's the things that all the other speakers do. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to move people away from this idea of giving speeches the way that they're typically given and turning them into performers. And you do not have to be an entertainer to be a performer. You certainly don't have to be a comedian to be a performer. And in fact, opening with a joke, unless you're a comedian, is probably not a great idea. Most, most articles that you read about public speaking, the first bullet point will say, tell stories. Or you see an article that the science behind why storytelling is so important. Well, we all know that storytelling is important. But what they leave out is one word right in that first bullet point. They leave out the word good. Tell good stories. Because if you open up a speech with a story that's not good, bam. If you tell a story that's a cathartic experience for you, but not supported by the through line of your, of your presentation, doesn't deliver on the promise, doesn't help uh, uh, deliver an example of something that you're teaching, then it's not relevant to them. So every single thing that we put into a speech needs to be relevant to the audience. It needs to be supported by the big idea that is a through line throughout your presentation and delivers on the promise of the presentation because every great presentation has a big idea that supports it and delivers on a promise. And what we keep doing is showing them this is the way the world looks. This is the way it could be. This is the way it looks. This is the way it could be. And we're driving toward that promise of this is the way it could be if you adopt this worldview because when you're giving a speech, often you only have a few minutes. So um, maybe you knew who I was before Mastermind Talks, but you you might not know me very well. So you don't know. I don't know if I trust this guy or not. And sometimes, and you know, you got, what, 15 minutes to do a speech there, although many people went over. But that's another story. 15 minutes is what you're supposed to do. 
So you're asking people to change the way they see the world in a short period of time. And if somebody's held on to a worldview for, gosh, you know, 30 years, you're asking them to change it in a few minutes, that can be pretty confronting. So if there's any way that they can say no, they may. If they can find any holes in your argument, they may. So I'll give you an example of what put, puts holes into your arguments. When you use absolutes, people may not trust you as much. Because an absolute is generally false. Just like all generalities are false. Do you see what I did there? All generalities are false? No, not all generalities are false. If I say nobody, nobody likes earwax flavored ice cream. You might think about it and go, oh, you know what? I knew this kid that used to pick his ears and eat it. I bet he would like earwax flavored ice cream. Boom. My argument is out the window. Be somebody who likes earwax flavored ice cream. Now, that's obviously an absurd extreme example, but that's that's the point of the example is that is that if we say everybody does this, it's always like this, you have to do this, you speak speakers, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Well, no, I don't have to do anything. I mean, you know, I can do whatever I want to do. I have to do what you do, tell me to do. So what we do is instead we say, you might consider this. There's an opportunity here for this. It often seems like people do this. Many times people do this. And then it, then it leaves room for their perspective, which actually closes the holes in your argument, which makes a big difference. Awesome. Love that. And I can tell how, how passionate you are about this subject. And just, just, from, just from this that portion right there, I can tell that there was definitely, like you said, a demon that made you write this book. And I'm sure this book probably came out pretty quickly, right? It actually took about eight months because <laughs> I did a lot of editing. But no, I mean, I, I'm telling you, man, this is like, I, 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 just, I just feel like I hope everybody in the world reads this thing because I really feel that not only will you be able to steal the show, like become a better performer, give better speeches, etc., but I feel that you will be able to express yourself so that you're fully self-expressed. And here's the thing. I believe that full self-expression comes first from a self-understanding. And in order to be a performer in the way that I'm suggesting, it's really helpful to know who you are. And often when you're younger, they, people say, I'm going to go find myself. I'm going to go find myself. Th yourself is not out there. Yourself is right here. It's already here. What performers are great at is stripping away all of these fat layers of persona that they wrap themselves up in, thinking that they are armor, but it's just wax paper-like armor. And if you strip it away and you actually allow yourself to be, you know, okay, here's the worst piece of advice ever given about giving a speech, ever, but I mean, forever given. When they, they say, people, when you're nervous, Somebody will suggest to you, think of your audience naked. What? Why would you do that? That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Here's why it's crazy. First of all, if you're thinking about your audience naked, it's not what you should be focusing on. That's not the big promise that you're delivering in your speech. Second of all, if you're already nervous, I think that may make you more nervous. Now, I'm looking around. I'm seeing all these people naked. That's not going to help me focus. But the truth is it's the performer who's naked. I think that's, that's what's important to recognize. Uh, um, Rosalind Russell, who was an actress, an old-time actress, she said that acting is like standing up in front of other people naked and turning around very slowly. And she meant it metaphorically, but that is true. And any time that you stand up and perform in a high-stakes situation, that's often what it feels like. And if you want to be able to do that comfortably so you're comfortable with that discomfort, then you read Steal the Show because that's my ultimate goal is to help you feel more confident, more comfortable being fully self-expressed by having a deeper understanding of self, by finding your own voice and focusing on results, not approval. That's a great wrap. Now, final piece of advice for people thinking about writing that first book. Don't be a perfectionist. 
perfectionism will kill creative endeavors. There's always more you can do. There's always another edit you can do. What, what, one of the reasons, one of the things that's made, made me get my books finished is because I always have a deadline. I have a due date. I signed on the dotted line and people are expecting it. And if you're self-publishing, you've got to figure out a way to make sure that your ass is on the line if you do not finish by the time you say you are going to. So sell that thing before you've written it. Tell them exactly when they're getting it. Tell them how long it will be. Tell them what's going to be in it. So you've got to deliver on all of that. Figure out a way to make yourself accountable to the delivery of that book. Love that. Public accountability, commit to a date, just like Michael commits to a date when he signs on the dotted line for his publisher. Well, that's a great place to wrap as well as I like, I like the callback, the wraparound to the results versus approval at the end. That was good yeah, too. Go. <laughs> well played. Thank um, you. Before we hop off here, where's the best place that people can go to find out more about you um, and also about the book coming out? So the book, of course, can be purchased anywhere books are sold, pre-order now. Uh, you know, the way it works on Amazon is they show you a discounted price and then it'll be discounted even further when it launches because it will be obviously, you know, tens of thousands of copies sold right away and then the book price drops. So buy it now. They'll give you even a lower price uh, when it is delivered and you'll be the first to get it. Uh, if you can't remember where the bookstores are, like Amazon.com or something, just go to stealtheshow.com. If you want uh, 50 tips that you can't afford to ignore, if you want to win praise and plaudits and applause, then go to heroicpublicspeaking.com and we've got an opt-in there for you. But if I update that website, you might get some videos also. So you'll see. You won't know until you get there. So you got to go over heroicpublicspeaking.com and uh, go steal the show.com, pre-order the book, and you'll love it, I promise. And I also make this promise always. If you buy one of my books and you don't think it's great, you send it to me, I will give you the cash back, full price, even if you paid less. I don't, obviously, the books, money goes to the publishers. That's the, pro, that's the difference in self-publishing. I get like $2 a copy in this. If I self-publish it, I get a lot more. But I would give you your money back if you don't think that is a great book. Awesome. Well, Michael, I can't wait. Uh, to read it and check it out. I can tell how excited you are about it. And I'm equally excited, maybe not quite as much, but I'm really excited about this book coming out. Cool. Hey, thanks. Chris. You did a great job, man. I'm really, really impressed with your skills. Nicely done. Awesome. Michael, thanks so much. I will talk to you soon. Okay.